I'm not able to be heard. All right. Um, I, I've just been told that I'm unable to be heard on, on my headset, um, so I will start over. I want to thank <laughs> uh, these things are never without their technical issues, and we do apologize for that. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll start over here. Uh, thanks to Gary for that fantastic introduction. Um, as he said, we do have a lot of ground to cover. I'll give you all a little bit of a road map um, with respect to where we're heading. Uh, and again, I do apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, uh, what we're going to do is, and I know all of you have your handout, uh, but the way we're going to proceed through this is try to quickly get through um, the first few slides, the introduction to workers' compensation and the like. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, uh, we'll go forward uh, attempting to um, get into the real issues, which are uh, Kateki and, and the Brasino decision. and and uh, the wave and walk provisions from Illinois. So uh, without further ado, uh, like I said, we've got a lot to go through, so I'll just get going here. Um, an introduction to workers' compensation. Um, as you all no doubt know, uh, the subrogation potential in a workers' compensation situation uh, arises when there is an employee in the scope of the of employment, um, and that uh, person is injured by a, a third party. Generally, these situations are all governed by statute, um, and uh, they involve third party actions in general. Uh, third party action being a uh, situation where the insured, uh, the injured worker, uh, employee sues. Um, a third party uh, based on that third party's negligence. Uh, workers' compensation subrogation allows um, the carrier to recoup monies paid to or on behalf of the employee. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in general, we'll be using a, a, a sort of a situation involving a salesperson on a sales call. Um, I will want to assume that that salesperson is rear-ended by a tortfeasor. Um, uh, or the third party at fault driver. It allows the carrier to either, one, intervene into an existing lawsuit filed by an employee, and this is generally the situation that comes up most, most often. Um, and I think, uh, I think Keith would agree with that, right? Um, yes, uh, and uh, it would allow them to file suit their own interest uh, in some situations. Um, the, uh, the purpose of subrogation as it is, is uh, to prevent double recovery. Um, as we all know, the, the law disfavors situations where, uh, a, is where a person is um, allowed to uh, collect twice for the same injury. Uh, the other uh, underlying purpose of uh, subrogation is to place the burden on the tortfeasor. Uh, the law favors this type of a situation where um, we, we place the burden on, in this case, the negligent driver. Um, and. Uh, now uh, that we have the underlying sort of issues defined, I'm going to let Heath continue and tell you about um, the sort of the situations uh, that we have, um, common terms and definitions, um, in order to uh, get you guys all caught up on, uh, on what we're talking about. Well, thanks, Tim. Um, we're switching heads sets right now because uh, the one I'm using um, I can't be heard on, so we're going to get that addressed. But basically, subrogation is the substitution of one person into the place of another regarding a lawful claim or right. There are some terms that we want you to be familiar with, and that is subrogor is the party whose debt is paid, and that's the insured or the employer. Subrogee is the party who paid the debt. That will be the carrier. The lien is the amount that's paid to the subrogor by the subrogee. And the lien will include, in Illinois, Section 8A medical benefits, TTD benefits, and permanency benefits. The third party suit is filed by an employee against an at-fault party. Illinois is governed by 
the 820 ILCS series, and that governs third-party actions. Section 820.3055 allows the carrier to be um, to file suit as subrogee of either the employer or the injured worker. And then you can bring suit against the tortfeasor. Who can suit be filed against? Basically anyone. In an auto case, you're going to look to the other driver. In a product case, you're going to look to the manufacturer, distributor, component part manufacturers. And in construction cases, of course, the general contractor, owner, architect, other subcontractors. When can suit be filed? This is important. In Illinois, there are various statutes of limitations. We have product liability statutes, construction statutes, and general negligence statutes. Two, four, five years. So you have to be careful in terms of which statute applies. In terms of necessary parties, everyone is available to be joined in Illinois. But you do not, if, the, if you're having a subrogation case and the employee does not bring an action, unlike some states, in Illinois, you do not need to name the employee as a necessary party. Allocation, as you'll, as you'll see later in our presentation, not all defendants are equal. So it's important that there's some type of allocation um, in the jury verdict. And finally, intervention petitions. Uh, when the employer is not brought in as a third party defendant, how do you keep tabs on the case? You file an intervening petition. And that allows for notice of all hearings, discovery, settlement conferences, and participation by the carrier. However, you cannot have discovery propounded on you, nor do you have the ability to issue discovery. So you're not truly a party, but you're getting notice of everything. So H1, the ILCS 305, is where the carrier or worker may file a third party suit. The carrier must wait to file until three months of the running of the statute of limitations. A practice tip, if you are getting close to the statute of limitations, you want to make sure that you're covered. If, if you cannot get the cooperation of the plaintiff's attorney, you want to file your own suit. And if two suits are filed, one by the carrier and one by the employee, it's OK. You can consolidate those cases, and they'll be issued on one track in the courthouse. And then finally, the carrier may intervene in existing third-party suits even after the statute of limitations expires. Now, when you have an inter intervening action to recover your lien, let's take a sample automobile case. There's a lien of $100,000, but unfortunately, the tortfeasor has a $20,000 minimum policy in Illinois. So you can recover your $20,000, but what about the rest of the $80,000? Well, let's say the employer had an underinsured motorist policy. I'm going to look to Tim right now to explain whether you can obtain those benefits or recover any part of your lien from an underinsured motorist claim. I'm going to switch headphones with uh, Tim. All right. Thank, thanks, Heath. Uh, and we, again, we do apologize for the technical issues that we're experiencing here, um, but uh, we'll, we'll work through them. Uh, one of the, the, the most common issues that we uh, have discussed um, with clients is, is whether or not uh, UM and UIM coverage applies to, uh, to subrogation, whether subrogation is possible. Uh, from a UIM or, or UM coverage. Uh, the, the short answer is that it's not. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the answer uh, no applies to equally to whether or not the UM or UIM policy was purchased by the employer or the employer. Uh, there's some reasons behind this. Um, uh, those include uh, that uh, the, the, the UM or UM policy was, was ultimately purchased by uh, the, the employee or the employer. Um, it did not come from the tortfeasor to begin with. So uh, it, it's a contract payment. It, it's not something that is recovering in, in tort. Um, again, it, it, it sort of insures the, against the risk of adequate compensation from the tortfeasor. It's not insuring the tortfeasor. And when we um, uh, originally spoke about, about these issues, um, 
really sort of the the burden uh, shifting situation uh, that that is is why uh, an essential purpose for for subrogation is not uh, available here, meaning that. Um, uh, recovery by the employer from the UM or UIM coverage uh, does not come from the tortfeasor, uh, so therefore the, the underlying purposes are not satisfied. Um, it, what it does not do is it does not um, ensure the other uh, bottom line um, or, or purpose of subrogation, and that's to ensure uh, that there's uh, the, the prevention of double recovery. Um, I would argue that um, the UM or UIM coverage is going to come uh, from from the policy and it's going to be paid to the employee, um, and therefore uh, a workers' compensation carrier ought to be able to subrogate against it. Um, but that's not the way that uh, that the Illinois courts have interpreted it. And we'll we'll uh, discuss in detail later uh, how many uh, inconsistencies there are with the way the Illinois courts have interpreted these situations. Um, now that we've d discussed UM or UIM coverage uh, and its inapplicability, what is the carrier entitled to? Um, uh, the carrier is in, entitled to the first money off the top, um, and this is uh, this is true in Illinois. It's not true, uh, really, in, in a lot of other states. Um, in, in a lot of other states, um, the uh, the uh, attorney may get um, the first money off the top, uh, the, the plaintiff's attorney, the employee, the employee's attorney, that is. Um, it may be uh, a situation where the costs are paid off the top, uh, but in Illinois, the carrier does indeed get the, the first money off the top. Um, the caveat to that is that the, uh, the lien must be reduced by 25% for attorney's fees uh, and the pro rata share of costs and expenses. So um, the maximum recovery in Illinois for a um, uh, a workers' compensation subrogation action is is going to be 75% of the lien. Uh, back to our salesperson or salesman example, if the lien is $100,000, uh, the employee files a third-party suit, settles it for $200,000, uh, the carrier is going to get a maximum of $75,000, uh, and the employee is going to get $125,000. Um, now, uh, in, in these cases where we, we have sort of implicitly assumed uh, that the claim, the underlying workers' compensation action, is, is closed. Um, I'm going to hand my headset over to Heath to have him explain to you what happens when it's not. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, when we're faced with a situation with an open workers' compensation case and the settlement of the third party action or a case that went to verdict, the carrier is actually entitled to suspend all payments in the underlying workers compensation case until the future obligations equal the third party recovery. So going back to the salesman example, let's say the lien is a hundred, settlement for two hundred, and there's an open workers comp exposure of forty thousand dollars. Well, you're allowed to suspend benefits in Illinois, but that's not quite the end of the story, as we know in Illinois. The case of Zuber versus Illinois Power Company, a Supreme Court case in Illinois, said that while you can suspend benefits, the carrier is actually responsible for payment of 25% attorney's fees on those suspended benefits. So if there's an open $40,000, there's another $10,000 that needs to be paid to close out the workers' comp case. Likewise, if the workers' comp benefits exceed $200,000, such as the salesman example, then you get to suspend benefits, pay these Zuber fees, until the $200,000 is used up. At that point, dollar one after, let's say there's $300,000, $400,000 of exposure, then you have to pay full, full value of that comp case, but you do get the benefit of a holiday or vacation, as it's called. Now, we've talked about intervention, a credit for workers' comp, but it's not quite that simple in Illinois. <laughs> I'm going to turn it back over to Tim to explain what happens now when the employer is brought into the third-party case. Thanks so much, Heath. Um, and, uh, Again, we, we, we do apologize for the for the situation with the headset switching and the delays that may cause, uh, but um, uh, we're, we are limited by technology. Um, we're, 
we're into the, the, the situation now where um, the, this, the workers' compensation subrogation gets difficult. Um, and uh, we're discussing employer liability exposure in Illinois law. Um, generally speaking, the employee has no direct claim against the employer or a co-employee. Um, and, and that's true uh, uh, almost carte blanche in 40, 45 of 50 United States. Uh, and uh, there are five, Illinois being one of them, where, where we'll see that it's not true in, in just a little bit. There are some exceptions to the employee having no direct action against the employer. Um, uh, you can see those. It, it's not accidental and doesn't arise from employment, not received in the course of employment, and not content, compensable under, uh, under the Act to begin with. Uh, the majority of these issues are going to arise in situations where workers' compensation isn't going to apply in the first instance. At least coverage for it won't apply. So um, uh, in, in the situation where we have no work comp, um, uh, to begin with, there is, of course, going to be no work comp subrogation. <laughs> um, uh, now, uh, the dual capacity doctrine is, is, is sort of convoluted as well in Illinois. Uh, it's sometimes called the dual capacity or entity doctrine. Um, it's a situation where the employer takes on a second role other than the imp uh, being the employer. Um, the, the exact steps are uh, that it has to occupy a second uh, capacity. Um, and must have a distinct legal persona. Um, in situations where those two uh, condition precedents are met, um, there can potentially be employer uh, exposure. Uh, and uh, the reason for this is that's what the statute says, first of all, um, and fairness. Uh, the uh, employer has already paid benefits or the carrier. Uh, why, uh, why should they allow to be sued by, by the employee when they've properly paid benefits under the Act? Um, uh, the Kateki case. Um, the Kateki case is, is uh, the Illinois court's codification of employer exposure to third parties. As we've discussed, um, uh, the, the well-defined and sort of well-reasoned um, uh, statutory scheme in Illinois starts to erode with Kateki. Um, it really uh, deals with the employer's exposure to third parties as opposed to the employee. Um, this means that uh, the employee could potentially file suit against a, uh, an alleged negligent tortfeasor, um, and that negligent tortfeasor could, uh, in turn, turn around and, and sue the employer as a third party for contribution. Um, we'll, and we'll get into uh, the, the background of it in, in the Illinois Joint Tortfeasor Act. Um, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that we feel it was wrongfully applied, and we think that they ought to have stuck with the, uh, the, the statute, um, uh, but instead they decided to adopt a similar approach to Minnesota. Um, uh, also, uh, New York is one of, the 45, or one of the five states that allows employer contribution, uh, as well as Idaho. Um, we'll also discuss uh, the Kateki cap and how that's going to affect situations uh, moving forward. Uh, the facts of Kateki are relatively simple. Uh, Mr. Kateki, Mark Kateki, uh, he brought an action for personal injury. Uh, he was injured uh, allegedly by uh, uh, the defendant Cyclops Welding Corporation's negligence, uh, and, and he alleged that they failed to design and construct uh, an agitator at his business where he worked Cyclops, um, uh, excuse me, at Keras. Um, he alleged that, uh, that Cyclops uh, negligently designed and manufactured the agitator. Mr. Kateki injured his hand in the agitator. Um, and uh, Cyclops then in turn filed a third party action against Keras. Uh, they sought contribution from the employer. Um, uh, the Kateki, uh, the facts are, are relatively simple, as I said. The, the holding, however, um, is not. And, and to discuss the effect of the Kateki holding, I'll turn it back over to Heath. Thanks, Tim. And in doing so, I'd like to take everyone back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, when all of this wasn't decided. You have attorneys for the uh, corporation Cyclops telling the court, we have a joint tort fees or contribution act. And rightfully so, they argued employers should be contributing to any tort judgment if they are partially responsible for an employee's injury. And at the same time, there's a competing statute, the Illinois Workers' Compact. And 
the employer's attorney, rightfully so, said, wait a second. The intent of the workers' compact is that the employer only be required to pay an employee the statutory benefit. So you have two statutes that were inconsistent. And what's a court to do? Punt and compromise. So we look to the effect of Kateki. The employer was found to be held responsible for contribution. And the right to sue the employer accrued to any defendant in the action. Again, the, there's no direct cause of action from the plaintiff to the employer, but all defendants can bring a third-party complaint against the employer. The employer, though, is only liable up to the amount of the lien. And this does not apply in the salesperson example where there's no potential employer contribution. So, if that was the end of the story, we wouldn't have a webinar. So I'm going to turn it back over to Tim to say what happens next after 1990. All right, so 1990 has come and gone, <laughs> as according to Keith. Um, and we're going to d discuss the effect of uh, the Kentucky waiver cases. Um, and uh, generally, the, the damages are going to be allocated to the employer that are going to be allocated to the employer based on um, the third party's uh, suit against it are going to be capped at the amount that was originally paid to the employee in the workers' compensation underlying case. Uh, in other words, there's going to be no new money uh, generally that's going to be paid out. Um, however, uh, and as you can see on your screen now, the, the uh, Kentucky cap, as, as we'll say, it, can be waived by contract. Uh, this makes for virtually unlimited exposure. Um, uh, th these Kateki waivers are often seen in construction uh, contracts. Um, it's an indemnity provision. Either it's, it's going to apply to uh, language in a contract that says um, a subcontractor will agree to indemn or defend, indemnify, and hold harmless a general contractor for all claims. Um, that's going to be uh, held as a valid Kentucky waiver, um, and it's going to uncap the damages that are going to be uh, potentially allocated uh, to the employer. Uh, there are many different kinds of of, of these waivers. Uh, the most common is is what I've just said: the the agreement to defend, uh, indemnify, or just indemnify and hold harmless from all claims. Um, but uh, it's important to note that uh, there's a lot of cases out there that have. Uh, discussed these uh, indemnification language uh, waivers. Um, some of them are held valid, some of them are not, uh, but this is really uh, sort of a case-by-case -case basis that we need to look at these at these things on. Um, now we're, we're going to get to sort of an, an interesting situation um, that is possible, uh, and again this most of these come up when there is no um, uh, indemnification provision and uh, in Illinois you have the or the carrier or the employer has the ability to waive the lien and walk um, and this is uh, accurately codified in the Batzel case uh, Millard Batzel um, got eight hundred thousand dollars in benefits um, he was he was crushed in a, in a fortunate uh, tractor trailer accident while he was working for his employer um, uh, the case ended up going to trial, returned a $13 million verdict. Um, the at-fault party, the, 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 the trucking company, filed a third-party action uh, against um, Mr. Batzel's employer, uh, and ultimately at, at verdict, um, the employer was found 30% at fault. On the hook for $3.9 million is the way that math works out. Um, as you recall, the, the employer's carrier had only outlaid $800,000 in benefits to begin with. Um, and uh, it was held that the employer can avoid contribution liability altogether by waiving its lien. Uh, they can do this even after judgment. Um, essentially, it can waive and walk. Uh, the courts have, um, have held that uh, that's a good faith thing to do. They aren't going to dictate an attorney's trial strategy. Uh, and therefore, it's allowable for um, the uh, subrogation interest of the, the employer's insurance carrier to uh, wait till trial and then waive and walk. Um, this does bring up an interesting issue that I think we'll get into a little bit later about good faith findings um, in the underlying work comp case. Um, uh, it's, it's a little bit strange to me that 
uh, a wave and walk provision like this uh, would be held in good faith, uh, but uh, in, in this case at least it, it was uh, held in good faith. Um, now, uh, we are going to discuss at this point um, uh, a little bit more of, a, of a, an issue with the good faith findings in Illinois, and I'm going to turn that over to Heath. Thanks, Tim. I want to go back a couple of slides, um, but I'm not going to bring them up. But I just want to go back to the Kentucky um, issue, um, where the construction contract is going to dictate whether there is a Kentucky waiver. And in Illinois, interestingly, those types of indemnification provisions in construction cases are actually invalid based on the Anti-Indemnity Act. However, Notwithstanding that it's void as against public policy, we're not going to allow people to uh, insure others for, your own, for their own negligence, um, the courts will still allow a fiction of sorts and allow that to be a Kotecki waiver. So it, it, it's a void provision, but it's allowed in this circumstance to operate as a waiver of the Kotecki cap. Also, it's important to get the contracts for everyone at the construction site. You can waive as to some defendants, but not others. So for instance, a subcontractor can actually waive as to a general contractor, but if that general contractor is not negligent, it's not going to make a difference. There may be another defendant, another subcontractor that was responsible for the injury, and there may be no waiver as to that subcontractor because there was no contract between the two parties. So you want to make sure who the waiver is effective against. It may not be all the defendants. And then, as I said earlier in the presentation, you want to allocate fault between the parties because that's going to dictate whether you have a lot of exposure or less exposure. Finally, not, as Tim said earlier, not all provisions are easy. <laughs> and there's a lot of case law and there's a lot of gray area. What I found is that in, in particular, if you think the case is going to settle, use the argument as best you can at a mediation. But if you think the case is going to go to trial, you have to know what your exposure is. In those situations, you want to move immediately for partial summary judgment and get a court ruling so you know what your exposure is. Now, we want to move forward from Kotecki a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about Brazino. Brazino is an interesting case. We're going to talk about an insurance procurement provision. Basically, the subcontractor employer agrees to provide general uh, liability, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, provide, provides additional insured coverage to the general contractor. And where that insurance is procured, it gets interesting. You're not allowed to bring a cause of action, a general contractor or any other party cannot bring a cause of action against an employer where that employer procured insurance for the general. So an example, you have a case that's worth $800,000 against the general contractor and they, bring in, they want to bring in the employer for contribution. The employer secured a $1 million policy for the general contractor. That's an easy case. It's going to get dismissed, the third party complaint for contribution, because you procured enough insurance to cover the potential loss. Here's where it gets dicey. Let's say you have a $1.3 million verdict and only a million dollars of coverage. Well. The general can maintain a third-party complaint against the employer under those circumstances. And the reason is you didn't, the employer did not procure enough insurance to cover the entire judgment. There's still $300,000 outstanding there. So Brazino says you got to allow the contribution action only up to $300,000. In the Monshine case, which is on your screen, if it's $300,000 of exposure, and this is on the EL policy, 
let's say the employer is determined to be 50% responsible. Monshine says you do 50% of the $300,000, so the exposure would be $150,000. Now I want to get to an interesting case that I recently had. By operation of law, you have a $6 million verdict, and the employer provided a $1 million policy to the general contractor, and provided an excess $5 million to the employer. You would think that there would be no way that you can have a third party complaint because there was $6 million and that covers the entire verdict. But no, once again, Illinois throws a wrench into things. Now I think Tim's working here. Are you, are you on Tim? I cannot hear you. All right, we're gonna keep working on that. So under that situation, we have Kojima, an Illinois Supreme Court case, saying you have to horizontally exhaust policies, meaning the first million dollar of the employer is in play, and before the excess is triggered, you have to actually submit the next million by the CGL policy for the general, and then the excess will kick in. So there's a million dollars there of exposure that the employer simply could not maintain or a procure for the general contractor. So under that situation, there's about a million dollars worth of potential coverage. And one additional point on Brazino, more often than not, it will operate as an affirmative defense as opposed to an outright dismissal at the inception of the case. And for obvious reasons, you don't always know the value of the case and whether it's going to exceed the policy or not. I'm gonna uh, put uh, Tim on to uh, cover a little more of Brazino. Uh, and, and actually, thank, thanks, Heath. Uh, what I wanted to do um, is, is sort of sum up um, the, uh, the situation that we have, excuse me, with the uh, Illinois Joint Tort Feeser Act, <coughs> Kentucky, uh, and Brasino, and, and, and essentially why we, why we think this is all a muddled mess and, and why we don't agree with the way the courts have, uh, have interpreted it. Um, uh, if we back up to uh, the workers' compensation section five of, of Illinois, um, we have a very well-defined statutory scheme. No uh, employer liability um, to the employee, um, and it's it is what it is. That's a, it's a very uh, sort of well-defined uh, status. And then we get to Kentucky, um, and uh, there is all of a sudden uh, there is employer liability to third parties. Um, so. Uh, in, in relying on the Joint Tort Feeser Act, essentially what the Kentucky case did was um, uh, invalidate the provisions of the uh, workers' compensation subrogation statutes in Illinois. Um, you know, all that, all that really being said, that's fine and, and, and understandable, and then we get to the Kentucky waiver cases. Um, and uh, that in that situation, the Illinois Supreme Court, or the Illinois courts have determined that uh, not only is the employer uh, liable up to and including the amounts that it paid the worker, uh, but we have essentially unlimited exposure if they agree to it. Again, in contravention of the statutes. Uh, and then, uh, as Heath just described, we have Brasino throwing further wrenches into the situation to the extent that even when uh, the employer um, provides insurance uh, to the third party, they can still be held liable. So. Um, uh, I'm going to hand the, the, the headset back over to Heath now, and he's going to uh, discuss some, some challenges to workers' compensation. Hi. Before I do that, I just want to – I'm sorry for jumping around. It's, it's hard with uh, sharing mics here. Um, but uh, we're going to make the best of the situation. Brazino and, and, and Heath, can you hear me I now? I can hear you now. This is great. We're both on. Okay. I, I think we've, we've solved – Almost 40 minutes into the presentation, we've now solved the uh, the microphone issue. <laughs> but, it's the best, but it's the best time because we have questions and answers it and is. things like that. So but let me indeed. just make one point on Brazino and, and how it relates to Kotecki. It doesn't. They're two separate concepts. And mm -hmm. the courts sometimes don't understand that, even some of our friendly circuit court judges in Cook County. Uh, um, I'll, I'll interrupt Heath and, and just make the point that most of them are not so friendly. <laughs> And so basically, if there's a Kotecki waiver on a $6 million judgment, it doesn't matter. You're not exposed to $6 million. 
you're exposed to Brazino comes into play then, as long as there's an insurance procurement provision. And a lot of times when there are these Kotecki waivers in the contract, these are sophisticated parties, and you can bet that uh, there are insurance uh, uh, procurement provisions in the contract. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about challenges to um, workers' compensation lien recovery. When I approach a settlement conference or mediation, there are three obstacles to recovering your lien. And that's going to be the plaintiff's ability to recover against the tortfeasor, i.e., is it a liability case? Is there a high amount of comparative fault? Two, the employer's liability for contribution. I have to know what the employer's potential liability is in terms of failure to train, failure to supervise, not maintaining a piece of equipment that the person's injured on. And then finally, I must know whether there is additional exposure in an open workers' compensation action. Because ultimately, I don't want the carrier to pay more workers' comp benefits only to have all that waived. We want to use the waiver as a means of closing out the workers' comp case by the familiar dollar contract. So, Tim, we were going to talk a little bit about some practice tips mm -hmm. at this point. Certainly, and uh, I think probably the most important practice is the first one. That's early involvement and, and investigation into these claims. Um, uh, the, probably the most uh, problematic issues that we run into arise um, when the claim is three years old and we get it, it comes across our desk and no investigation uh, it has been done. Really, if, if the uh, workers' compensation subrogation attorney is involved from the beginning, um, we uh, were able to head off these issues, uh, uh, you know, get collect the contracts, see if there's a Kentucky waiver, if there's a potential for uh, exposure above and beyond the, the lien, um, then we can really head off all these issues and understand and advise um, you, our clients, uh, of the correct course of action. That's a good point, Tim. And early involvement and determining all of these issues from the outset is critical. I also believe that it's important to keep that momentum going and to be a team as the case progresses. And that's the second point of our summary and practice tips. The subrogation attorney and the claims person for subrogation is really going to be the quarterback here. Because what I found is that the insurance carrier has a workers' comp attorney. They have an employer liability attorney on the contribution action. And they have someone trying to collect the lien. I have three attorneys involved. And recently that happened in the mediation that Tim and I worked on. Mm -hmm. And what we decided to do was to reach out to the attorney for the employer, reach out to the attorney for the comp carrier, and bring it all together. Mm -hmm. All these things merge. All these points merge. And you, you can't settle a comp case if there's employer liability, and you can't tell the employer liability if there's an open comp case. And uh, that's a great point, Heath, and the case that you're talking about. Um, it was one of those cases that we were involved early. Uh, we were able to do some investigation, um, and really uh, we were able to quarterback that situation, that, that case, because we had all the information in our hands, whereas those that got involved later um, just didn't have the, the access to the information and didn't have the knowledge that we did. So the, the quarterbacking uh, was made possible by that by the early involvement in investigation. Um, plus, what happens is we're able to inform the client. We're, we're able to inform you, the carrier, about these points, and everyone at the carrier can talk. Now, sometimes the carrier doesn't have all the coverages, <laughs> so it's important <laughs> to reach out to everyone and right. to make sure that everyone is on the same page when you go into a settlement conference and a mediation to be prepared, have a game plan. And in that case uh, we were talking about, we were able to get a nice recovery on the lien and close out the comp case for a dollar, which was a wonderful recovery there. Absolutely. Um, uh, sort of the other practice tips that, that we um, are less important 
yes, but but still need uh, need note here is that we need to keep in mind the statute of limitations, and and he touched on those earlier. We've got a two-year uh, statute of limitations for personal injury in some contexts, and a four-year in other contexts, namely construction. Um, but uh, those things are all, uh, all all issues that should be brought up with your your attorney as well. And uh, uh, I don't know if Heath, if you had a if you had a point there. Um, all right. Uh, the the other uh, situation practice tip that we're talking about is, and, and Heath, have, Heath and I have both dealt with with cases where jurisdictional analysis becomes important. Um, and in Illinois, there there's no clear cut law on it. Um, but however, if you have work comp benefits. Uh, paid uh, in a different state and an accident that happens in Illinois, um, the jurisdictional analysis can become important. For instance, uh, another state like Wisconsin might have more favorable subrogation uh, laws uh, and Illinois may indeed um, adopt those laws and use them with respect to the underlying third-party suit. So that that's also important. Um, we do have a couple of examples and I know we're getting uh, short on time here, so I think uh, what we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to breeze through this this um, auto exam, auto accident example and get right to the product liability and ultimately the construction case because that's the one that we are dealing with uh, the Kentucky waivers and, and the Brasino and like that just to, to help you um, uh, sort of uh, apply what we've learned today to a factual scenario uh, we have an auto accident um, employee injured while driving from job site to job site. Um, the employee suffers neck and back injuries. Carrier pays $100,000 medical and indemnity, uh, and the employee turns around uh, to sue the at fault party. Um, the work comp carrier intervenes, asserting its lien. Uh, this is essentially different than, all, than our salesperson example that we've been using throughout this. It's a very simple type situation. Um, there's likely no potential for uh, a Kotecki waiver or uh, a Kotecki situation to begin with, uh, to the extent that the employer in this concept. Or in, the, in this uh, uh, factual pattern, uh, did nothing wrong, um, and uh, it, so the car carrier can intervene, assert its lien, and it has a great chance of recovering seventy-five thousand dollars. Right, uh, Tim. That's right. That's the goal: seventy-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But it doesn't always work out that way, even when the employer is not a party to the case. Um, let's uh, when you get to a settlement conference, it's going to come down to the plaintiff's ability to recover. Mm -hmm. whether it's a bad liability case, whether they can even recover um, enough money to uh, reimburse you your $75,000. And in situations where, let's say, the recovery is 50000 because it's a bad liability case, what do you do? Well, sometimes you're going to agree to a split. You do a third for the uh, lien recovery, a third to the plaintiff himself or herself, and then finally a third to that person's attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, because it is a strong lien that you have, you can even play hardball and get a little better deal than a third. And sometimes that's worked for me as well, where you basically try and get a half of, of whatever's due and owing, and the plaintiff and his or her attorney can split their half. Uh, yeah, and, and that's that's an excellent point. Uh, of course, in, in all uh, situations where we're attempting to subrogate, um, there's underlying issues in the, in the underlying case that uh, that may be a problem. It's it's possible that uh, uh, maybe the the third party or the, the employee may not have a great case against the third party. Maybe it's a, a, a left turn in front of a, um, in front of a straight driver, and there's some contributory negligence involved or, or something like that. But um, like this, this this is sort of the the baseline. This auto accident example is sort of the baseline issue because there's going to be no um, uh, there's likely to be employer um, liability, uh, third-party claims that are brought against the employer. Uh, there's certainly not going to be any Kentucky cap issues, um, and uh, there is definitely not going to be any Prisino issues. Um, and uh, as we as we run very close to time, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to hand it over to, to Heath, and I think we'll just go and do our construction example because that has all of the issues in it uh, before we take a few questions. Sure, sure. The construction example um, is an uh, employee falls from a scaffold, um, injuring his head and uh, right shoulder. The uh, workers' comp carrier, um, as you can follow along now, pays uh, $400,000 in medical and indemnity benefits, and the workers' compensation case is open. 
let's say there's further exposure in the amount of three hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars well when we get to a settlement conference we want to look to a credit if the verdict is high enough and we'll make those Zuber payments so that, that point highlights Zuber the next point is the employee sues the owner general contractor and subcontractor who modified the portion of the scaffold to do its work. The defendants bring in third-party complaints of contribution against the employer, a different subcontractor for failing to provide its employee with a safe work environment. The general contractor and employer had a written contract whereby the employer would procure insurance with the general contractor. A flag should go up. We got a Brazino issue but the employer fails to obtain the insurance. <laughs> no Brazino issue. <laughs> and and we've, we've actually thrown pretty much every potential wrench into this factual pattern, so um, just, just <laughs> all of you attendees are aware of that. And while this could be the subject of a complete different webinar, although there's no Brazino issue, there's now a breach of contract issue against your insured. And you have to be careful to move for summary judgment if the facts allow, because then you're going to leave them bare on an uninsured claim. So just keep that flag there and know it's out there. (laughs) The contract between the general contractor and the employer also had language which would result in a Kotecki waiver. Okay? We have unlimited exposure. There was no contract between the employer and the other subcontractor. No Kotecki waiver to those defendants. So we have multiple defendants. Some there's a waiver, some there's not. The case is scheduled for mediation. How would you analyze the employer's options? You have to know what the size of the verdict's going to be. When you're settling the case, you're in a much better position because you don't have to move until you know what everyone else is doing. But you have to know what the general contractor's liability is. You have to know what the employer's liability is. You have to know what, your, what the other contractors and subcontractors on the site's liability will be. All of this has to be analyzed well before the mediation or settlement conference. There's not a chance you're going to get it done at the mediation if you don't have it all figured out beforehand. Can you hear me? Talk again, Tim. I cannot hear you. All right, and I and again, I apologize for the switching. It, it appears as though um, we are back to the one headset. Um, um, uh, now we're going to move to uh, a, a question and answer period, and, and some of you have submitted questions, and and uh, more of you are going to have questions rolling in. Um, one question that I've gotten here from Kate in Iowa is. If there is a Kentucky waiver, who is obligated to pay the quote new money um, above the cap? Um, that, and that's a fantastic question. Um, and uh, Heath and I have actually done some work on a case such as this. Uh, and um, it, the short answer is, uh, it's it's a factually dependent insurance policy interpretation. <laughs> um, it could potentially be the EL carrier. Um, which is generally going to be, well, usually going to be the, the, the same as the work comp carrier. Um, there's going to be some terms, limits, and exclusions that are going to apply, potentially, um, and uh, that may be the case. O- oftentimes, we see that it is indeed the EL carrier. However, um, it could be the general liability carrier as well that could end up holding um, holding the, the bag, so to say, to, to pay the new money. Um, so uh, in, a, in a situation where we have a Kentucky waiver, uh, really, the best and only thing to do um, is to um, get the insurance policies together or have your attorney collect them for you um, and do a, a very in-depth coverage analysis. Um, that's really, uh, really all we're going to be able to do. Um, <clears throat> it looks, uh, it looks like we have also have a question from uh, from, uh, from looks like Lisa from California. Oh, and I can hear you now, Heath. So that's that's fantastic. Great. This is a question about loan, loaning and borrowing employers. Um, are they, how are, how are they uh, uh, liable and are they protected by Kotecki? Um, this occurs many times. A loaning employer will pay out the comp benefits. 
with the borrowing employer is the one that's sued for contribution. And the borrowing employer is sued because they didn't train their person or supervise their person appropriately. What happens there? The borrowing employer and the loaning employer are both protected by the exclusivity provision. They're both protected by the exclusivity provision in workers' compensation, and they're both capped by Kotecki. So they all they both have that protection. There's another question from Kate in Iowa. Kate, oh wait, uh, Heath, I, I just wanted to say that uh, that looks that appears to be wrong. We already took the question from Kate in Iowa. This one is actually from John in Texas. Got it. <laughs> the the question from John in Texas is. Um, and, and am I able to be heard now? I hear you. Okay. Um, one of these days we'll get the technical issues uh, sorted out. Um, is and the the question is, um, what constitutes the key amount? Um, and that's a, that's a, an absolutely fantastic question. Um, and the answer is that it includes past amounts that were paid by the work comp carrier, and uh, addition to future amounts that uh, that are potentially going to be paid by the, the employer. And Heath, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit, Mike. Sure. Um, can you hear me? I cannot. I cannot either, so I'm going to switch headphones again. Okay. Right. And this, and this gets very dicey um, because in workers' comp, we don't always know what the exposure is. Is it, a perm to is it a perm total, a wage differential? Is it a scheduled injury? So this is something at a settlement conference that's easy to take care of, less so when you have a judge deciding it after a trial and you're trying to figure this all out. But the rule is future obligations are also a part of the Kotecki cap. Applying the rule is the challenge. Okay, and uh, thanks, thanks for that, Heath. Uh, thanks for the elaboration. I've got problems with my headset again. Um, we've gone a, a little bit over time, and we apologize for that. But I think we started a, a minute or two late. Anyway, we have uh, lots more questions, um, but we no longer have have time to do those. <laughs> so uh, please rest assured, um, uh, we've got questions from from Terry and Thomas uh, and Angela and, and Tracy, and we're going to uh, address each of those after the the webinar. I'm actually going to make Heath stay here, even if it's got to be overnight, <laughs> to, to get these questions answered. So we, we appreciate your time. Uh, we thank you for attending, and uh, we apologize for these technical glitches. Um, but uh, thank you very much, and I hope to hear from all of you uh, at some time in the future. Thank, thanks very much for allowing me to participate with you, and uh, it was a pleasure. All right. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.
the organ.